the likelihood of all of these companies going to zero? I think it's super, super duper unlikely, right? My portfolio, right, from 100K, it increased to 200K because of this strategy. Like almost like 100% because of this one single strategy and I was, as you can see, I was very aggressive. And when the market turned against me, I didn't believe, I just thought that cannot be, you know, like it just cannot be this way. It have to go back up again, right? I have to make money again. And eventually I lost like 50% of my entire portfolio. Yeah, because the S and P five hundred, like brilliance of minds of people, are just really thinking about it, and it did not just last for decades, but even more than hundred years, where yeah. we have just seen the growth of one dollar and it compounded, and it's already nineteen thousand dollars in today's time, con considering the the interest that has been gained. You mentioned. ETFs, exchange traded funds, you are an advocate about it and also options, which you explained earlier. Can you tell us more about it for those who are interested? What is your strategy behind it? Is it something that's easy to do? And can you how can you earn money from it? Basically, it's the most important thing. Yeah. So uh, I think the concept is still pretty similar, like what I share with you, the ABOS, the Arigato Buffer Option Strategy. So instead of doing options on individual companies i prefer doing it on etfs because etfs it's a basket of great businesses let's say when you uh do s p 500 which has 500 companies right uh your apple your microsoft your nvidia your tesla your whatever google whatever companies that you like they are all inside s p 500 so once you buy s p 500 literally you have all these companies inside your portfolio, they become yours, right? So it becomes a lot safer because you have a diversified portfolio rather than just one individual stock like Tesla. But if Tesla go bust, your, your entire portfolio also goes to zero, right? But right now you have 500 over great businesses. What is the likelihood of all of these companies going to zero? I think it's super, super duper unlikely, right? So that's why you want to make sure you only make a promise to buy ETFs that you are strongly bullish about, that you are willing to collect them in the long run because they just can never go to zero, right? And Charlie Munger said, right? It tell me where I'm going to die, I'm not going to go there. And since I know that it's not going to go to zero, I can really do it in a very safe way. So what I'm going to do is I can do like a selling options, put options, right? On ETF, like S&P 500, or like just on the example SMH. And if the stock price, which is the ETF price, did fall below the promise price that I want to purchase, then I just go and buy the stocks, buy the ETF. I'm more than happy to do that. Finally, I'm able to collect that, that ETF into, into my portfolio. I finally, I'm able to own SMH. I'm, own, I'm able to own S&P 500, right? So that is the scenario number one. If the stock price in withdrawal below my uh, promised purchase price, so then I'm happy, right? However, the scenario number two is, what if when I actually sell this put option, the stock price at the end of the, the one month, usually I do a one month sell put, right? At the end of one month, it did not drop. In fact, it probably went up or stayed stagnant. So because I only promised to buy at, in this case, $200, but the stock price after one month is still $225. It's still pretty far off, right? So if that's the case, nobody is ever going to sell me their stocks at $200 because I promised to buy $200, right? But right now it's, sell, it's selling at $225. They're never going to sell me at $200. So in this case, I don't get to buy the stocks. But am I happy? Yes, I'm still happy because... I still get to collect my free passive income, my premium of this insurance contract, this coverage that I sold, I collected in the first place, right? Just like imagine you buy an insurance as a consumer today, whether you get into accident or not, you will have already paid the insurance company. So the insurance company already make money from you from day one. So that's how as uh, as in the option market, I prefer being an insurance seller, right? Because 
I make money from day one. The moment I strike a deal with a person who want to buy insurance from me, I already make money. So at the end of that expiry of the contract term, whether do I get to collect the stocks or do I not get to collect the stocks? But be it either scenario, I am happy because I get to do what I promised to do and what, what I want to do. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you for ex explaining it again. Very generous of you. Speaking of like trading, I'm sure you have a lot of experiences, battles, scars, <laughs> and pains, and also great wins. If I may ask, without telling the amount, what's your greatest trade? No need to mention the amount, but only the percentage. And what was your conviction behind it? What What's the story behind your greatest trade? All right. I think uh, before I share the greatest trade, maybe I can share the worst trade first, the worst trade. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's good. So, <laughs> and your learnings from the worst trade. <laughs> yeah, because it's always good to learn from the worst experience first, right? And only from the worst experience, I developed my greatest experience in my investing. So uh, from my worst trade, uh, I used to be very aggressive on options. When And at that time, I was actually doing the buying option side because I wanted to make money even faster, right? Because selling options, there's only a maximum you can earn, which is a premium. But buying options, you can earn so-called unlimited if you know how to do it. So at that time, when I first started my options uh, trading, I was just like many other people. I was very aggressive. I want to make money fast. So I really went in a lot. Like 50% of my portfolio at that time was in this buying option strategy. And originally, I was actually very, very happy because my portfolio, right, from 100K, it increased to 200K because of this strategy. Like almost like 100% because of this one single strategy. And I was, as you can see, I was very aggressive. So that's why my portfolio from 100K grew to 200K. It's like, and I felt that, oh my God, I was, I was so invincible, right? I felt like, oh, wow, you know, like maybe because of this, I will be finally able to quit my job and all this because that's what I wanted back then. And uh, guess what? Because when I get so greedy and like so mind blinded or like I blinded by my profits, I continue to double down on this strategy. And, and when the market turned against me, I didn't believe, I just thought that cannot be, you know, like it just cannot be this way. It have to go back up again, right? I have to make money again. And eventually I lost like 50% of my entire portfolio. So imagine like my 100K profits, it's got wiped out. And then I lose another $50,000. So like in, in that short period of time, I literally lost 150 k because of this greed that I have in me. And I wasn't actually applying options the right way. And I also didn't choose to cut loss because especially when you do options, you do need to cut loss because there are certain things that you cannot just pray and hope that it's going to go up and there's always time decay and everything but i just let my emotions take over me and i did not do any single thing of that and eventually when i cut loss it was already very very painful like 50 percent. so from this experience i got to firstly understand a lot more about my own downfall that i can get very greedy and very emotional when it comes to investing and um that's how I also get to understand that short-term trading is really not for me because I don't think, don't think that I'm able to master my emotions so well, especially if the time frame is so short. I will be into this denial uh, situation that I refuse to take any action. I just let my portfolio sit and hopefully it can recover, but it just doesn't happen, right? So that's when from this, I get to know that really long-term investing is more suitable for me even though it might not be as fast as what short-term trading can do for you, like not like what 100% growth, but then it's not going to be like 100% drop as well. It's not like that kind of crazy roller coaster ride. And uh, because of that, I shift towards long-term investing.